Chapter 14, Part 1 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 14, Part 1 The Liberal Lives of Jesus. Bibliography David Friedrich Strauss. A Life of Jesus for the German People, Leipzig, 1864, 631 pages. The Christ of Faith and the Jesus of History, A Criticism of Schleiermacher's Life of Jesus, Berlin, 1865, 223 pages. The Schenkel Affair in Baden, A Corrected Reprint from Number 441 of the National Zeitung of the 21st September, 1864. The Halfwayers and the Wayers, eighteen sixty five. Daniel Schenkel, The Portrait of Jesus, Wiesbaden, eighteen sixty four, editions one and two, four hundred five pages. Fourth edition with a preface opposing Strauss's The Old Faith and the New, eighteen seventy three. Karl Heinrich Weishacker, Studies in the Gospel History, Its Sources, and the Progress of Its Development. Gotha, 1864, 580 pages. Heinrich Julius Holtzmann, The Synoptic Gospels, Their Origin and Historical Character, Leipzig, 1863, 514 pages. Theodore Keim, The History of Jesus of Nazara, Three Volumes, Zurich, Volume 1, 1867, 446 pages. Volume 2, 1871, 616 pages. Volume 3, 1872, 667 pages. Die Geschichte Jesu, Zurich, 1872, 398 pages. Karl Hase, The History of Jesus, Academic Lectures Revised, Leipzig, 1876, 612 pages. Willibad Beschlag, Das Leben Jesu, First Part, Preliminary Investigations, 1885, 450 pages, Second Part, Narrative, 1886, 495 pages, Second Edition, 1887 through 1888. Bernhard Weiss, Das Leben Jesu, First Edition, Two Volumes, 1882, Second Edition, 1884, First volume, Down to the Baptist's Question, 556 pages. Second volume, 617 pages. Strauss writes, in concluding the preface of his new Life of Jesus, quote, My hope is that I have written a book as thoroughly well adapted for Germans as Renan's is for Frenchmen. Close quote. He was mistaken. In spite of its title, the book was not a book for the people. It had nothing new to offer, and what it did offer was not in a form calculated to become popular. It is true, Strauss, like Renan, was an artist, but he did not write like an imaginative novelist with a constant eye to effect. His art was unpretentious, even austere, appealing to the few, not to the many. The people demand a complete and vivid picture. Renan had given them a figure which was theatrical, no doubt, but full of life and movement, and they had been grateful to him for it. Strauss could not do that. Even the arrangement of the work is thoroughly unfortunate. In the first part, which bears the title, The Life of Jesus, he attempts to combine into a harmonious portrait some of the historical data as have some claim to be considered historical. In the second part, he traces the origin and growth of the mythical history of Jesus. First, therefore, he tears down from the tree the ivy and the rich growth of creepers, laying bare the worn and corroded bark. Then he fastens the faded growths to the stem again, and describes the nature, origin, and characteristics of each distinct species. How vastly different! How much more full of life had been the work of 1835! There, Strauss had not divided the creepers from the stem. The straining strength which upheld this wealth of creepers 
was but vaguely suspected behind the billowy mists of legend we caught from time to time a momentary glimpse of the gigantic figure of jesus as though lit up by a lightning flash it was no complete and harmonious picture but it was full of suggestions rich in thoughts thrown out carelessly rich in contradictions even out of which the imagination could create a portrait of jesus it is just this wealth of suggestion that is lacking in the second picture strauss is trying now to give a definite portrait in the inevitable process of harmonizing and modeling to scale he is obliged to reject the finest thoughts of the previous work because they will not fit in exactly some of them are altered out of recognition some are filed away there is wanting too that perfect freshness as of the spring which is only found when thoughts have but newly come into flower the writing is no longer spontaneous one feels that strauss is setting forth thoughts which have ripened with his mind and grown old with it and now along with their definiteness of form have taken on a certain stiffness there is now no hinted possibilities full of promise to dance gaily through the movement of his dialectic all is sober reason a thought too sober renan had one advantage over strauss in that he wrote when the material was fresh to him one might almost say strange to him and was capable of calling up in him the response of vivid feeling for a popular book too it lacks that living interplay of reflection with narration without which the ordinary reader fails to get a grip of the history the first life of jesus had been rich in this respect since it had been steeped in the hegelian theory regarding the realization of the idea in the meantime strauss had seen the hegelian philosophy fall from its high estate and himself had found no way of reconciling history and idea so that his present life of jesus was a mere objective presentment of the history it was therefore not adapted to make any impression upon the popular mind in reality it is merely an exposition in more or less popular form of the writer's estimate of what had been done in the study of the subject during the past thirty years and shows what he had learnt and what he had failed to learn as regards the synoptic question he had learnt nothing in his opinion the criticism of the gospels has run to seed he treats with a pitying contempt both the earlier and the more recent defenders of the Markan hypothesis. Weisse is a dilettante. Wilke had failed to make any impression on him. Holtzmann's work was as yet unknown to him. But in the following year he discharged the vials of his wrath upon the man who had both strengthened the foundations and put on the copping stone of the new hypothesis. He says in the appendix to his criticism of Schleiermacher's Life of Jesus, quote, Our lions of St. Mark, older and younger, may roar as loud as they like, so long as there are six solid reasons against the priority of Mark to set against every one of their flimsy arguments in its favor, and they themselves supply us with a store of counter-arguments in the shape of admissions of later editing and so forth. The whole theory appears to me a temporary aberration, like the music of the future or the anti-vaccination movement, and I seriously believe that it is the same order of mind which, in different circumstances, falls a victim to the one delusion or the other. But he must not be supposed, he says, to take the critical molehills thrown up by Holtzmann for veritable mountains against such opponents he does not scruple to seek aid from schleiermacher whose unbiased but decided opinion had ascribed a tertiary character to mark even gefrorer's view that mark adapted his gospel to the needs of the church by leaving out everything which was open to objection in matthew and luke is good enough to be brought to bear against the bat-eyed partisans of mark f c bauer is reproached for having given too much weight to the tendency theory in his criticism of the gospels and also for having taken suggestions of strauss's and worked them out supposing that he was offering something new when he was really only amplifying in the end 
he had only given a criticism of the gospels not of the gospel history but this irritation against the old teacher is immediately allayed when he comes to speak of the fourth gospel here the teacher has carried to a successful issue the campaign which the pupil had begun strauss feels compelled to quote, express his gratitude for the work done by the Tübingen school on the johannine question close quote. he himself had only been able to deal with the negative side of the question to show that the fourth gospel was not an historical source but a theological invention they had to deal with it positively and had assigned the document to its proper place in the evolution of christian thought there is only one point with which he quarrels bauer has made the fourth gospel too completely spiritual strauss says quote, whereas the fact is that it is the most material of all Close quote. it is true strauss explains that the evangelist starts out to interpret miracle and eschatology symbolically but he halts halfway and falls back upon the miraculous enhancing the professed fact in proportion as he makes it spiritually more significant beside the spiritual return of jesus in the paraclete he places his return in a material body bearing the marks of the wounds beside the inward present judgment a future outward judgment and the fact that he sees the one in the other finds the one present and visible in the other is just what constitutes the mystical character of the gospel this mysticism attracts the modern world Quote, the johannine christ who in his descriptions of himself seems to be always outdoing himself is the counterpart of the modern believer who in order to remain a believer must continually outdo himself the johannine miracles which are always being interpreted spiritually and at the same time raised to a higher pitch of the miraculous which are counted and documented in every possible way and yet must not be considered the true ground of faith are at once miraculous and no miracles we must believe them and yet can believe without them in short they exactly meet the taste of the present day which delights to involve itself in contradictions and is too lethargic and wanting in courage for any clear insight or decided opinion on religious matters Close quote. strictly speaking however the strauss of the second life of jesus has no right to criticize the fourth gospel for sublimating the history for he himself gives what is nothing else than a spiritualization of the jesus of the synoptics and he does it in such an arbitrary fashion that one is compelled to ask how far he does it with a good conscience a typical case is the exposition of jesus's answer to the baptist's message quote, is it possible jesus means that you fail to find in me the miracles which you expect from the messiah and yet i daily open the eyes of the spiritually blind and the ears of the spiritually deaf make the lame walk erect and vigorous and even give new life to those who are morally dead any one who understands how much greater these spiritual miracles are will not be offended at the absence of bodily miracles only such an one can receive and is worthy of the salvation which i am bringing to mankind Close quote. here the fundamental weakness of his method is clearly shown the vaunted apparatus for the evaporation of the mythical does not work quite satisfactorily the ultimate product of this process was expected to be a jesus who should be essential man the actual product however is jesus the historical man a being whose looks and sayings are strange and unfamiliar strauss is too purely a critic too little of the creative historian to recognize this strange being that jesus really lived in a world of jewish ideas and held himself to be messiah in the jewish sense is for the writer of the life of jesus an impossibility the deposit which resists the chemical process for the elimination of myth he must therefore break up with the hammer how different from the strauss of eighteen thirty five 
he had then recognized eschatology as the most important element in jesus's world of thought and in some incidental remarks had made striking applications of it he had for example proposed to regard the last supper not as the institution of a feast for coming generations but as a paschal meal at which jesus declared that he would next partake of the paschal bread and paschal wine along with his disciples in the heavenly kingdom in the second life of jesus this view is given up jesus did not found a feast Quote, in order to give a living centre of unity to the society which it was his purpose to found jesus desired to institute this distribution of bread and wine as a feast to be constantly repeated Close quote. one might be reading renan this change of attitude is typical of much else strauss is not in the least disquieted by finding himself at one with schleiermacher in these attempts to spiritualize on the contrary he appeals to him he shares he says schleiermacher's conviction quote, that a unique self-consciousness of jesus did not develop as a consequence of his conviction that he was the messiah on the contrary it was a consequence of his self-consciousness that he arrived at the view that the messianic prophecies could point to no one but himself Close quote. the moment eschatology entered into the consciousness of jesus it came in contact with a higher principle which overmastered it and gradually dissolved it quote, had jesus applied the messianic idea to himself before he had had a profound religious consciousness to which to relate to it doubtless it would have taken possession of him so powerfully that he could never have escaped from its influence Close quote. we must suppose the ideality the concentration upon that which was inward the determination to separate religion on the one hand from politics and on the other from ritual the serene consciousness of being able to attain to peace with god and with himself by purely spiritual means all this we must suppose to have reached a certain ripeness a certain security in the mind of jesus before he permitted himself to entertain the thought of his messiahship and this we may believe is the reason why he grasped it in so independent and individual a fashion in this therefore strauss has become the pupil of weisse even in the old testament prophecies he explains we find two conceptions a more ideal and a more practical jesus holds consistently to the first he describes himself as the son of man because this designation quote, contains the suggestion of humility and lowliness of the human and natural close quote. at jerusalem jesus in giving his interpretation of psalm 110 quote, made merry over the davidic descent of the messiah he desired to be messiah in the sense of a patient teacher exercising a quiet influence Close quote. as the opposition of the people grew more intense he took up some of the features of isaiah chapter fifty three into his conception of the messiah on his resurrection jesus can only have spoken in a metaphorical sense it is hardly credible that one who was pure man could have arrogated to himself the position of judge of the world strauss would like best to ascribe all the eschatology to the distorting medium of early christianity but he does not venture to carry this through with logical consistency he takes it as certain however that jesus even though it sometimes seems as if he did not expect the kingdom to be realized in the present but in a future world era and to be brought about by god in a supernatural fashion nevertheless sets about the establishment of the kingdom by purely spiritual influence with this end in view he leaves galilee when he judges the time to be ripe in order to work on a larger scale Quote, in case of an unfavorable issue he reckons on the influence which a martyr death has never failed to exercise in giving momentum to a lofty idea Close quote. how far he had advanced when he entered on the fateful journey to jerusalem in shaping his plan and especially in organizing the company of adherents who had gathered about him 
it is impossible to determine with any exactness. He permitted the triumphal entry because he did not desire to decline the role of the Messiah in every aspect of it. Owing to this arbitrary spiritualization of the synoptic Jesus, Strauss's picture is in essence much more unhistorical than Renan's. The latter had not needed to deny that Jesus had done miracles, and he had been able to suggest an explanation of how Jesus came in the end to fall back upon the eschatological system of ideas. But at what a price? By portraying Jesus as at variance with himself, a hero broken in spirit. This price is too high for Strauss. Arbitrary as his treatment of history is, he never loses the intuitive feeling that in Jesus' self-consciousness there is a unique absence of struggle, that he does not bear the scars which are found in those natures which win their way to freedom and purity through strife and conflict, that in him there is no trace of the hardness, harshness, and gloom which cleave to such natures throughout life, but that he, quote, is manifestly a beautiful nature from the first, close quote. Thus, for all Strauss's awkward, arbitrary handling of the history, he is greater than the rival who could manufacture history with such skill. Nevertheless, from the point of view of theological science, this work marks a standstill. That was the net result of the thirty years of critical study of the life of Jesus for the man who had inaugurated it so impressively. This was the only fruit which followed those blossoms so full of promise of the first life of Jesus. It is significant that in the same year there appeared Schleiermacher's lectures on the life of Jesus, which had not seen the light for forty years, because, as Strauss himself remarked in his criticism of the resurrected work, it had neither anodyne nor dressing for the wounds which his first life of Jesus had made. The wounds, however, had secretized in the meantime. It is true, Strauss is a just judge, and makes ample acknowledgment of the greatness of Schleiermacher's achievement. He blames Schleiermacher for setting up his, quote, presuppositions in regard to Christ, close quote, as an historical canon, and considering it a proof that a statement is unhistorical if it does not square with those presuppositions. But does not the purely human, but to a certain extent unhistorical man, who is to be the ultimate product of the process of eliminating myth, serve Strauss as his theoretic Christ, who determines the presentment of his historical Jesus? Does he not share with Schleiermacher the erroneous, artificial, double construction of the consciousness of Jesus? And what about their views of Mark? What fundamental difference is there, when all is said, between Schleiermacher's derationalized life of Jesus and Strauss's. Certainly, this second life of Jesus would have frightened Schleiermacher's away into hiding for thirty years. So Schleiermacher's life of Jesus might now safely venture forth into the light. There was no reason why it should feel itself a stranger at this period, and it had no need to be ashamed of itself. Its rationalistic birthmarks were concealed by its brilliant dialectic, and the only real advantage in the meantime was the general recognition that the life of Jesus was not to be interpreted on rationalistic, but on historical lines. All other more definite historical results had proved more or less illusory. There is no vitality in them. The works of Renan, Strauss, Schenkel, Weizsacker, and Keim are in essence only different ways of carrying out a single ground plan. To read them one after another is to be simply appalled at the stereotyped uniformity of the world of thought in which they move. You feel that you have read exactly the same thing in the others, almost in identical phrases. To obtain the works of Schenkel and Weizsacker, you only need to weaken down in Strauss the sharp discrimination between John and the synoptists so far as to allow of the fourth gospel being used to some extent as an historical source in the higher sense, and to put the hypothesis of the priority of Mark in place of the Tumingen view adopted by Strauss. The latter is an external operation, and does not essentially modify the view of the life of Jesus, 
since by admitting the Johannine scheme, the Markin plan is again disturbed, and Strauss's arbitrary spiritualization of the synoptics comes to something not very different from the acceptance of that, in a higher sense, historical gospel alongside of them. The whole discussion regarding the sources is only loosely connected with the process of arriving at the portrait of Jesus, since this portrait is fixed from the first, being determined by the mental atmosphere and religious horizon of the sixties. They all portray the Jesus of liberal theology. The only difference is that one is a little more conscientious in his coloring than another, and one perhaps has a little more taste than another, or is less concerned about the consequences. The desire to escape, in some way, from the alternative between the synoptists and John was native to the Markan hypothesis. Weisse had endeavored to effect this by distinguishing between the sources in the fourth gospel. Schenkel and Weizsacker are more modest. They do not feel the need of any clear literary view of the fourth gospel, of any critical discrimination between original and secondary elements in it. They are content to use as historical whatever their instinct leads them to accept. Says Schenkel, quote, Apart from the fourth gospel, we should miss in the portrait of the Redeemer the unfathomable depths and the inaccessible heights. Close quote. To quote his aphorism, quote, Jesus was not always thus in reality, but he was so in truth. Close quote. Since when have historians had the right to distinguish between reality and truth? That was one of the bad habits which the author of this characterization of Jesus brought with him from his earlier dogmatic training. Weizsacker expressed himself with more circumspection. He says, quote, we possess in the fourth gospel genuine apostolic reminiscences as much as in any part of the first three gospels, but between the facts on which the reminiscences are based and their reproduction in literary form, there lies the development of their possessor into a great mystic, and the influence of a philosophy which here, for the first time, united itself in this way with the gospel. They need, therefore, to be critically examined and the historical truth of this gospel, great as it is, must not be measured with a painful literality. One wonders why both these writers appeal to Holtzmann, seeing that they practically abandoned the Markan plan which he had worked out at the end of his very thorough examination of this gospel. They do not accept as sufficient the controversy regarding the ceremonial regulations in Mark chapter 7, which, with the rejection at Nazareth, constitute, in Holtzmann's view, the turning point of the Galilean ministry, but find the cause of the change of attitude on the part of the people, rather in the Johannine discourse about eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the Son of Man. The section Mark chapters 10 through chapter 15, which, as a certain unity, they interpret in the light of the Johannine tradition, finding in it traces of a previous ministry of Jesus in Jerusalem, and interweaving with it the Johannine story of the Passion. According to Schenkel, the last visit to Jerusalem must have been of considerable duration. When confronted with John, the admission may be wrung from the synoptists that Jesus did not travel straight through Jericho to the capital, but worked first for a considerable time in Judea. Strauss tartly observes that he cannot see what the author of the characterization stood to gain by underwriting Holtzmann's Markan hypothesis. Weizsacker is still bolder in making interpolations from the Johannine tradition. He places the cleansing of the temple, in contradiction to Mark, in the early period of Jesus' ministry, on the ground that, quote, it bears the character of a first appearance, a bold deed in which to open his career. Close quote. He fails to observe, however, that if this act really took place at this point of time, the whole development of the life of Jesus, which Holtzmann had so ingeniously traced in Mark, is at once thrown into confusion. In describing the last visit to Jerusalem, Weizsacker is not content to insert the Markan stones into the Johannine cement. 
he goes farther and expressly states that the great farewell discourses of jesus to his disciples agree with the synoptic discourses to the disciples spoken during the last days however completely they of all others bear the peculiar stamp of the johannine diction thus in the second period of the markan hypothesis the same spectacle meets us as in the earlier the hypothesis has a literary existence indeed it is carried by holtzmann to such a degree of demonstration that it can no longer be called a mere hypothesis but it does not succeed in winning an assured position in the critical study of the life of jesus it is common land not yet taken into cultivation that is due in no small measure to the fact that holtzmann did not work out the hypothesis from the historical side but rather on literary lines recalling Wilke, as a kind of problem in synoptic arithmetic and in his preface expresses dissent from the tumingen school who desired to leave no alternative between john on the one side and the synoptics on the other whereas he approves the attempt to evade the dilemma in some way or other and thinks he can find in the didactic narrative of the fourth gospel the traces of a development of jesus similar to that portrayed in the synoptics and has therefore no fundamental objection to the use of john alongside of the synoptics in taking up this position however he does not desire to be understood as meaning that quote, it would be to the interests of science to throw synoptic and johannine passages together indiscriminately and thus construct a life of jesus out of them it would be much better first to reconstruct separately the synoptic and johannine pictures of christ composing each of its own distinctive material it is only when this has been done that it is possible to make a fruitful comparison of the two Close quote. exactly the same position had been taken up sixty-seven years before by herder in holtzmann's case however the principle was stated with so many qualifications that the adherents of his view read into it the permission to combine in a picture treated in the grand style synoptic with johannine passages in addition to this the plan which holtzmann finally evolved out of mark was much too fine drawn to bear the weight of the remainder of the synoptic material he distinguishes seven stages in the galilean ministry of which the really decisive one is the sixth in which jesus leaves galilee and goes northward so that Schenkel and Weizsacker are justified in distinguishing practically only two great Galilean periods, the first of which, down to the controversy about ceremonial purity, they distinguish as the period of success, the second, down to the departure from Judea, as the period of decline. What attracted these writers to the Markan hypothesis was not so much the authentication which it gave to the detail of mark though they were willing enough to accept that but the way in which this gospel lent itself to the a priori view of the course of the life of jesus which they unconsciously brought with them they appealed to holtzmann because he showed such wonderful skill in extracting from the markan narrative the view which commended itself to the spirit of the age as manifested in the sixties holtzmann read into this gospel that jesus had endeavored in galilee to found the kingdom of god in an ideal sense that he concealed his consciousness of being the messiah which was constantly growing more assured until his followers should have attained by inner enlightenment to a higher view of the kingdom of god and of the messiah that almost at the end of his galilean ministry he declared himself to them as the messiah at caesarea philippi that on the same occasion he at once began to picture to them a suffering messiah whose lineaments gradually became more and more distinct in his mind amid the growing opposition which he encountered and finally he communicated to his disciples his decision to put the messianic cause to the test in the capital and that they followed him thither and saw how his fate fulfilled itself it was this fundamental view which made the success of the hypothesis holtzmann not less than his followers believed that he had discovered it in the gospel itself although strauss the passionate opponent of the markan hypothesis 
took essentially the same view of the development of Jesus's thought. But the way in which Holtzmann exhibited this characteristic view of the sixties as arising naturally out of the detail of Mark was so perfect, so artistically charming, that this view appeared henceforward to be inseparably bound up with the Markan tradition. Scarcely ever has a description of the life of Jesus exercised so irresistible an influence as that short outline. It embraces scarcely twenty pages with which Holtzmann closes his examination of the Synoptic Gospels. This chapter became the creed and catechism of all who handled the subject during the following decades. The treatment of the life of Jesus had to follow the lines here laid down until the Markan hypothesis was delivered from its bondage to that a priori view of the development of Jesus. Until then, any one might appeal to the Markan hypothesis, meaning thereby only that general view of the inward and outward course of the development of the life of Jesus, and might treat the remainder of the synoptic material how he chose, combining with it, at his pleasure, material drawn from John. The victory, therefore, belonged not to the Markan hypothesis, pure and simple, but to the Markan hypothesis as psychologically interpreted by a liberal theology. End of chapter 14, part 1